time to freshen up your memory on physics. We're going to talk about heat, heat transfer, and so on. When we talk about energy, uh, you must realize that there are different kinds of energy. So there are chemical energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, and there is also thermal energy. What we're going to talk about now, we assume that all the other kinds of energy are constant. So the potential energy is constant, the kinetic energy is constant, the chemical energy is constant, and the only thing that varies is the thermal energy, the thing that has to do with temperature and phase changes, aggregation state changes. So we're going to use uh, uh, symbols and units here. Uh, the unit for energy is Joule, and the unit for power is joules per second or watts. So what letter to use? Well, pretty many books use Q. Uh, actually, it varies what they use. Uh, but a problem is that we have already used uh, an ordinary Q for volumetric flow. So what to do? Well, I will try to use a slanted Q actually for both power and energy. I think you should be able to figure out from the context if we're talking about energy or if we're talking about power. So keep track of the units. Uh, sometimes we are interested in the power per surface area and then we will use the small Q for that. So how many watts per square meter is being transferred. Try to remember in your physics classes, how did heat transport work? What processes were involved and how could you affect the size of the heat transport? Diminish it or enlarge it? What kind of design parameters were there? Take a minute and try to remember that. Okay, I hope you remember there are three kinds of processes here for heat transfer. One is conduction. The second one is convection and the third one is radiation. We're going to focus on conduction and convection here. Uh, uh, we'll mention radiation uh, shortly. Uh, but let's start with con conduction. Conduction is diffusion of heat. So heat diffusivity, just as you have mass diffusivity and diffusivity of momentum, you also have heat diffusivity. So this is something that happens on the molecular level. So interactions between molecules that makes uh, the diffu uh, heat diffuse from one place to another, from high temperatures to low temperatures. And we have the Fourier's law for heat conduction, which states that the power and transmitted per square meter of area is minus the connectivity times the con uh, temperature gradient. And we can rephrase that using heat diffusivities instead. And then it looks like this. And we will use alpha for the heat diffusivity. Remember that diffusivities have the same unit no matter what kind of thing we are transporting. So it's square meter per second for heat diffusivity, square meter per second for mass diffusivity, and square meter per second for diffusivity of momentum. But those three different things, they don't need to have the same value. They do if we have an ideal gas. Okay, what about convection? Well, in convection, uh, it's larger things that are moving. Uh, so packages of air, packages of water, for example. So we need to have some kind of fluid. And in a fluid, you can have either laminar flow or turbulent flow. In laminar flow, all molecules are moving uh, in a pretty regular way. So you have uh, streamlines going like this, like my fingers. In turbulent flow, you instead have twirls moving around and we can talk about eddy diffusion so swirls of fluid moving around in in strange ways we can talk about natural convection and forced convection in natural convection these movements uh, are due to changes in or differences 
in density. And if you have a gas, for example, you quickly get differences in densities because you have differences in temperature. So you remember ideal gas law, you quickly see that the density is dependent on temperature. And for forced convection, you have pumps or fans to drive things forward. And the equation for uh, convection is simply that Q equals a heat transfer coefficient times the area times the temperature difference between two places. It's a good idea to have some kind of feeling for how large a heat transfer coefficient can be. So let's do some ballparking. Uh, so let's first talk about air. If you have natural convection of air, so just the temperature differences that create the movements, you typically have a heat transfer coefficient of a few watts per square meter and Kelvin up to perhaps 10 or something like that. It all depends on how large the temperature differences are. The larger temperature differences, the more uh, serious these movements are and thus the larger the heat transfer coefficients. If you have forced convection, so if you have a fan, uh, you typically have heat transfer coefficients above 10 and up to perhaps 100. If you have water instead, now water is a better conductor. So if water moves around, it also becomes much better heat transfer coefficients than you get for air. So for natural convection of water, you typically have a few hundreds of watts per square meter in Kelvin. Uh, and for forced convection uh, of water, you can have from several hundred up to several thousand uh, watts per square meter in Kelvin. But if you have condensing water or if you have boiling water, you have even more than that typically. So you can have from a few thousand watts per square meter in Kelvin up to perhaps 10, 20, 30, thousand watts per square meter in Kelvin. So that's approximately how large these values are. Now, we're talking about conduction and convection. But if we have a wall, let's say that we have a wall that looks like that, and then we have one temperature on this side and one temperature on that side, and we need to calculate all the way from this side to that side. So what happens here? Well, we have two different processes. We have heat transfer to the wall, we have conduction inside the wall, and then we have heat transfer on the other side. And we're going to talk about heat transfer uh, coefficients. That's what happens in the air or the fluid, if it's water here. And then heat conductivity. And then for the thing that takes us from one side to the other, we're going to talk about overall heat transfer coefficients. So, we can set up an equation uh, for uh, the heat transfer from here to here. So you have a temperature in the bulk air and you have temperature close to the surface, infinitely close to the surface. So you have this equation here, Q equals a heat transfer coefficient times the temperature difference. Inside the wall, you have heat conduction. So you have a conductivity divided by the thickness. The thicker the wall, the more difficult it is for the heat to go through. So the conductivity divided by the thickness times the temperature difference, so the temperature on this side to the temperature on that side. And then on this side you have heat transfer coefficient again, so a heat transfer coefficient times uh, the temperature difference. And if you uh, have it in the units watt, you have to multiply everything with area, so you have like this. Okay, let's now define the overall heat transfer coefficient as uh, the equation that takes us from this side to that side. So Q equals the overall heat transfer coefficient, which we will call K, times the area times the temperature difference from here to there. So from these four equations, we can figure out what K is expressed in the heat transfer coefficient the heat conductivity and the heat transfer coefficient on the other side. How do we do that? Well, we know that, uh, that the temperature uh, 
from here to there changes in a certain way. So if we if we compare the temperature differences from here to here uh, and say that okay temperature from this side minus the temperature on that side that must be the same as the temperature here compared to the temperature there so this one minus that one and then this one again minus that one and that one minus that one that over there so we get this equation but these temperature differences we know what we can express them as because of the equations we had just a moment ago so we can express it like this q divided by uh, k the overall heat transfer coefficient equals q divided by heat transfer on, on one side of the wall times the area uh, plus q times the thickness divided by the conductivity and the area plus q divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the other side and the area and if we have steady state conditions then q is the same all over and if the wall is plain then the area is the same all over again so you can take away q and you can take away a and you get this equation note that you don't get this equation if you have something that is round because then the area increases as you go outwards you get a slightly different equation then but what about radiation well according to Stefan's Boltzmann's law if you have an object uh, how much does that uh, emit by radiation well it depends on the temperature of the surface to the power of 4, the area of the surface and the emissivity of, uh, of the object. So that is how um, good this object is of emitting things through that radiation. And if you multiply these th uh, things and then you multiply it by Boltzmann's constant as well, then you get how many watts this object can emit. What about absorbing uh, radiation well if you have uh, something that surrounds this first thing we talked about you can first think of how much does this other thing emit well that must be the emissivity of that object the area of that object and the temperature of that object to the power of four and times Boltzmann's constant as before so that radiation is now going towards this first thing so this second object is totally enclosing our first object but uh, there might be an absorptivity here that is not uh, not necessarily one so an absorptivity so a capability of absorbing radiation so you multiply uh, the absorptivity the of the first object the emissivity of the second object with the Boltzmann's constant and the temperature to the power 4 of the second object and the area of the second object. Okay, let's simplify a bit. Let's say that these two objects are pretty close, so the area is the same. And let's assume that the emissivity of the object we are studying has the same value as the emissivity. That is not, not necessarily the case. And why is not that necessarily the case? Well, actually, absorptivity and emissivity depends on wavelengths. And the wavelengths, in turn, they are dependent on the temperature of the, of the subject, of the object that's emitting the radiation. Uh, so uh, my uh, T-shirt here, it's green, so it emits... Uh, re-emits certain wavelengths and absorbs others so it's a bit iffy but let's in this course we can safely assume that the emissivity and absorptivity is the same and all kinds of errors in that we just say that, okay that's uh, an, an uncertainty in our calculations but uh, wait a minute how does absorptivity work I mean, if you if you have light coming through this uh, water bottle here, clearly some light is going through and some is absorbed here. In, and you might remember Lambert Beer's law that says something about the uh, intensity of the uh, of the light as it goes through. So how does a black body really work? 
that's slightly outside the chorus, but I would recommend you to to spend a while and try to think about that. Uh, and what I definitely would like you to think about is how does a microwave oven work? If I put this one in a microwave, where does the heating occur? On the surface? Inside? And how is that connected to Lambert Beer's law? That you need to be able to answer when you do composite task four, actually. So think of that. And a final thing in this uh, screencast, before we head over to an example in the next screencast, what does a steep temperature gradient actually imply? If you look at this figure here, you see that the temperature gradient is different in different places. Is a steep temperature gradient something that denotes good insulation or poor insulation? Look at the next screencast for the answer.